Hello there. I'm going to give a talk that I gave to um, students at Taylor's University recently. Um, and it's on universal design and understanding the concept of disability. The topic was under architecture and people with disabilities. So it's more or less the same thing. When it was posed to me that the students were doing a wellness center and before that a pavilion for disabled persons focusing on physical disabilities um uh, it was a welcome thing for me to give uh, whatever i could share uh, with the students and um it's, i think it's a second year project and um so i'd like to start this with where i'm coming from um as a um someone who is involved in Taylor University's um program um programs in the past and um also been around teaching architecture formerly at University of Malaya but at the moment now I am uh, as you could see here um the founder and CEO of Zazve Universal Design and also, I'm a coach and mentor of a Rediscover Your Sense of Self program for architects. And do um, send me an email um, or, and, or do connect with me in any of these uh, social media um, that is there um, in Instagram, LinkedIn, or Facebook. And also do check out Talk Architecture podcasts uh, for more content and up to date with some of these topics that I are bringing forth to everyone. So there are two things that an architecture student need to start understanding uh, and start developing their skills and knowledge in um, crucial to get them started in architecture and which will be something that will serve them for the rest of their life as an as an architect oh which is the power of observation um the skill of observation and conversation these two things just something that is similar in some of the professions uh, which is a core skill but in architecture it became notable um that these are the core skills so just telling a story or providing a compelling nar narrative or just a simple narrative that does the job for the type of building or the type of project that you are um, dealing with is, is a great start you have peers um in the architectural fraternity that comes along and give uh, some advice um such as this in the design thesis studio where the student um, gets input from um, people who are um, uh, leading companies and and um, as you can see um, uh, critical architects we we it's important to have very good external critics who are critical and who will support the student in being critical in their work as they progress because uh, design thesis is a year-long project so when i talk to the students about uh, this issue and i i set out to de define what is design and what is universal design because people would think universal design is something to do with designing for people with disabilities is a separate thing, but it's actually core of design. And I will explain my reasoning for this. Now we're taking in the quotation in Small Projects book by Kevin Mark Lowe, 2014. Going back to design is a conversation between creativity and context. I was telling the student about, um, you design something, it could be a, the form on a site here. Um, we'll just use this props 
a form on a site, yeah? So uh, often the idea was that it's all to acknowledge the site context, but context is more than just about the site. The context is defined as understanding people and relationships. When the designer is empathizing with the user who's using the space. So it's all about relationship, people and how they relate to the building, to the, to the site and to the context. And when the designer approach in making sense of the place, connecting people with the existing context, is making a new context. So from you know whatever situation that the context in, you are actually when you do the, some a design, it is you're making a new context. So so when you talk about people and relationships, people and how they use the space, how it is, you know, the, how they use how they use architecture, and that is the core of it all. When you look at this quote, where design is to do with context, then you as a designer, you use your creativity to, Im to improve that context to a new context, obviously. And that there is a conversation going on, conversation with yourself, a conversation with others, like I, I showed the peers, the architectural crit critiques, um, that come to the studio to give you some ideas or debate about what you're doing. Another thing that's important is learning from precedents and site visits, which helps the designer to empathize better. So what is the type of project that you're doing, a wellness center or a pavilion? So visit these sort of places if you, uh, as much as you can, where you are in that city, in Kuala Lumpur, for example or a study about them uh, uh, elsewhere as precedents. And then uh, you would get more ideas and understanding and there will be a conversation that you're having with yourself and which you will start with uh, your, your tutor and others. So what is architecture by giving meaning to forms in this way? And, and then you will understand because of empathizing with the user, we're going back to the topic of universal design, you will understand better the function in form and function. But quickly here, the universal design is the design and composition of an environment so that it can be accessed, understood, and used for the greatest extent possible by all people, the user, regardless of their age, size, ability, or disability. You know, so design, other words, sometimes you use the word inclusion, inclusive design, inclusivity. And before universal design, you have barrier-free uh, principles, which is much more um, easier for the layman to, to understand. And I will explain to that later when I go into universal design principles. So it's an, an environment or any building, product, or service in that environment that should be designed to meet the needs of all people the user who wish to use it. So sometimes there need to be um, service given, given uh, in terms of uh, assistance for the user, apart from the building as a building that is designed for the user. So this is not a special requirement for the benefit of only a minority of the population, but a fundamental condition of good design. So when universal design is considered to be the core design concept, in the design of anything that you do, especially for public spaces and public buildings, then you know elements of it or ideas that is based on universal design could be the catalyst or the main idea or focus in your design. Check out the link below. Such as in the work of Connie Lai, um, who did a universal design as the core concept a core idea in her library design in PJ Old Town. The volume of that, um, much like uh, OMA's library, uh, Ramco House library, idea of having the ramps going up from the ground level to the first, second, and third, and so on. Um, what Connie also did similarly, but she was careful with how it will work later because they, the students had to do a lot of detailed design later on to convince that it works. 
and the ratio um, of the ramp and the landing will need to work in a sense that um, the minimum ratio. So um, that is comfortable for a library design. So she went for one is to 40. And one is to 40, you don't need railings. It's very gradual. And um, that the way that it's designed is easy for a wheelchair user to get around um, the books, uh, shelves, and the uh, study carols, and so on. And there are flat areas, so it's more stable and not just inclination. So, so there was all these details that you need to deal with in terms of uh, getting up to the flat areas as well. So, um, it is seems technical, but that's what architecture is about: is uh, coming to the concept that is realized to the detail design, and and convincing others of it rather than you just accept that it's an interesting concept. So that's why the design thesis is quite rigorous in that way. 15% of the population, as I said earlier, from World Health Organization. However, an increased number um, of vulnerable people include older persons. Here we have a group of participants who are of diverse needs. Um, I did explain on the diverse needs based on physically disabled person's needs. Could be someone using a wheelchair or other apparatus or assistive device, walking frame, walking um, aids and walking a cane, a walking stick, you could use it. A sensory disabled person is generally those to do with the five senses, um, sight, uh, or vision, uh, hearing or listening, um, smell, and um, taste and touch. So uh, sensory disabled person need to um, be using other sense sensory or senses more because to compensate for the loss of one of the senses, such as being deaf or person having hearing impairments or a blind person, or a person who is vision impaired. Intellectually disabled persons are people who have, who are either slow learners or have their brains wired differently. That's what they call it. They're different in that sense. Um, and people who are autistic on the autistic autism spectrum or the ADHD and people who have Down syndrome and other uh, cognitive disabilities, uh, similar with mentally disabled persons, people with mental health disorders, clinically um, having that problem. But the more and more you have mental health um, issues among the population that architecture could help with sense of um, uh, healing or um, a sense of um, space that is conducive to cognitive disorders. And a communication disabled person could be um, those who have speech impairments and or not able to um, be clearly audible by others or clearly understood. So we're not focusing on the disability or the impairments. We're focusing on the needs, yeah? So uh, this is a, just a note of what is disability. And you can find it in the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities website, a UN enable definition in preamble. Is, this is an important understanding of what disability is. Um, it's, um, it is a concept and you need to recognize that disability is an evolving concept. It happens during the lifetime of human being from a baby to to the end of life as a, a baby one is dependent on other people to take care of oneself and towards the end of life also someone will be dependent on others to take care of them so we have here in between sometimes you have temporary disabilities 
um, being injured in a sports, um, broken leg or skiing accident or um, track, accident on the roads, other such setbacks uh, you normally would not like to have. But these are what we consider temporary disability. And that disability results from the interaction between persons with impairments and attitudinal and environmental barriers that hinders their full and effective participation in society on an equal basis with others. So there are people who design with attitudes that I'm not really gonna care for uh, people's needs. I'm just gonna think about my building as an art piece or um, I can do that, but I still don't wanna care for people in the sense that it's gonna be designed, not universally designed. You know, it's, it's gonna be very difficult for physical disabled person to use it or confusing, you know, not uh, easy to find one's way around. And that probably is hindering people with um, other people, uh, the, uh, the diverse needs, for example, cognition and sensory disabilities. So it is the attitude of the designer, the developer, or anyone responsible to decide on how design would be that will create environmental barriers. And that's a direct link, you know, of disability uh, with attitudes. And um, I was just giving this illustration of a traditional um, vernacular house in our country where there's a very steep stairs and set of stairs and as one grow older one could just renovate it and, and make it the inclination better like 30 degrees rather than 60 degrees like what it is now and or just put a ramp into it so that you can actually utilize um the house on stilts when we talk about accessibility or inclusion or universal design we are regarding that uh, are places and spaces accessible, the ones that we like, like our favorite restaurant. In our country, we have a lot of this five foot ways and shop houses that it's a bit of a problem for some because of the steps leading to them. And uh, one parent or one individual in a family could be not included in family activities uh, because of a favorite favorite place for them to go to a restaurant and so on. And it's something that's evolving as well for our family. So what happens to one person affect the other other the whole family setup. So so this is the idea that we're trying to get to the students to understand. So um Hello, um, we continue with um, giving some ideas on how we look into universal design. The first part earlier, we discussed about the definition of design and how universal design fit into that definition and the idea of inclusivity and not to deal you know, it's a design separately from design. So some of the efforts made in surveying existing spaces, um, going around the city centers, transportation hubs, uh, using the transportation uh, for public use, such as the light rail transit, um, and these three factors, street environment, public transportation, the buildings, have to be seamless uh, travel in terms of there is should not be any barrier, uh, such as being illustrated there on the left uh, with regard to a very high curb without any ramp at its side to negotiate independently would be preferable, but has to be assisted by others. So that defeats the purpose of universal design in our environment. 
Um, there are places in Southeast Asia where um, there is consideration that has been given to universal design by incorporating tactile guiding blocks, um, such as the warning tile and the line type. On the right is the office building, on the left is uh, a Singapore um, MT, uh, MRT uh, station. And inclusion includes consideration to um, provide for ease of uh, mobility around traffic hubs, transportation hubs. In this case, um, efficiency is a key if you want if you want to include disabled person as a commuter during rush hour and so on. Other consideration is also cultural. Uh, buildings such as a theater. And also, when we come to this part, we're looking at the architect as embracing universal design. As universal design takes off as the core ideas around all the detail design that uh, was implemented in Koshan Theater, a crutch holder is being incorporated into the reception counter. Apart from service, by the access officer that is noted, that can be read um, there in the notice. And the con color contrast um, of having a white tabletop um, so that vision impaired person can identify um, where to look for help as well. So, and there are other parts where you can see the um, tactile guiding block go to this reception counter so that they could find their way around. Textile guiding block is something that is very um, necessary in transportation hubs, but in certain areas you can have uh, services by others to assist a vision impaired persons or blind persons around the area. Uh, so these are to be considered. We also had visits to public housing like the Pungo Regalia in Pungo, Singapore. And um, students did um, in the uh, universal design elective at master's level um, case studies with the visits that they did and noted what are the universal design features there, such as um, here we have um, the use of staircases and ramps, the use of uh, textile guiding block or detectable warning substance and the contrast in color and wider uh, ramped areas, uh, ramped access are what, uh, have a bigger space rather than the minimum space because then you can have conversation as you get up the ramp. Um, it is also for everyone and guardrails being placed accordingly to detect um, edges and handrails to assist with those with weaker lower limbs. We talk about also how we work with the architect, um, working on the architect plans and drawings for a um, high rise condominium uh, development and branding the development, the multi-generational living concept, the developer um, had a very favorable response by the um, the clients, sorry, the customers were snap up a lot easily um, during the COVID time in 20, 2020 and bought by young couples seeing that this is a place where they could invest in even to their old age, if they would like to also um, have their um, dependent, um, dependents uh, staying with them as well. So that would, the ideas that is shown in the showroom was very convincing in a way that you could, um, you have the basic infrastructure of door openings and the ideas of how you could 
um, do the interior up for multi-generational generation living. The idea that the shower stall could be installed later if you if you want um, a glass or um, uh, something to be dividing the space between the shower and the the um, toilet area, for example. But you also have the option of not having it if you want accessibility. And they were what was interesting about the developer um, about eight of them were trained and uh, with me on universal design um, and and I'm assist I assisted them with um, the drawings appraisals and also gave points to the architects on how to uh, understand some of these uh, requirements and why these requirements are needed. So that helped a lot uh, for them innovating from the basic principles to ideas later on that they got elsewhere. So that was a plus. And the idea of using also the wet, the yard as a wet kitchen on the right photograph and uh, making the kitchen area feels bigger. It can be converted to a yard back if you don't want it as a wet kitchen. And um, we showed the developers some of these uh, housing development board showroom pictures that we, we got earlier in Singapore of the granny flats, 36 square meters size. Um, and of course, you know, some things, it's not easy to, to make it work like the folding door, uh, but the whole, I, I tried and tested that and it's possible when there is a lack of um, space to do that so that you can turn around in a wheelchair inside the space if you have a folding door, it's possible. But there are people who uh, do not need a wheelchair full time and who could stand up and the grab bar would be a great idea to to get up and shower. Uh, so it's flexible. The design provide for flexibility and adaptability as needs are met. The 36 square meters flat um, idea also showed how the cabinet can be taken out uh, in a uh, like a pedestal or um, um, you know, um, get leaving space underneath the countertop so that you could do your work sitting down in a chair or washing plates and so on. It's all boils down to the critical dimensions and anthrop anthropometrics and economics. So I reminded the students that um, in the first year, you were exposed to this um, part of architecture that deals with the functional aspects for a typical man and woman. Um, but we also need to consider anthropometrics and ergonomics for a disabled persons. So I was giving them idea that taking a wheelchair um, that is available where you are at the university, maybe in a customer service area, um, borrow it for a while and do an assimilation exercise around the building, the spaces, in the studios, uh, try um, using the ramps, you, opening doors, switching on and off light um, switches and um, using spaces such as accessible toilet, um, you can also blindfold yourself and use staircases to, to find the relationship again, the idea of observing um, what happens with a human being um, interacting with the building. So it's important when you set out that if you were to use a wheelchair simulation exercise, for disability awareness and understanding human relationship to building, 
uh, to measure elbow to elbow as if you're wheeling the wheelchair and also when your foot stick out from the back of the wheel to where your toe is. To see that the basic dimensions for measurement is with a human being in there. Then you could understand why those standards were recommended as such. Um, if you were to measure this with many people in a wheelchair, you will see that they have different dimensions and different heights. This especially um, with regard to the elevation here on the left, um, there are many types of wheelchairs as well because the wheelchairs accommodate to the human being. We have people who are very small, people who are tall, and so on. And um, so there are certain uh, critical dimensions that is needed to be done so that one could reach the light switches or um, you can't really touch the floor well when you're in a wheelchair. So the, the switches also have to be at a certain height and um, knee space, if you want to get into the under the countertops or the desk. And previously, um, Building Construction Authority of Singapore at the width at 680. Um, but really, uh, this is the, the basic dimension that you need. So at ramp landings, 900 millimeters by one. 1,200 millimeters is minimum where the where you don't have the wheels on the inclined area. So this is the sort of basic, you, when you play with the basic dimensions, you can understand better the reason why um, you need that basic dimensions and argue with uh, whoever that is uh, funding the development. So in trying out the wheelchair, you could see that if you were to wheel uh, one revolution of the wheel as you go up, that will take that amount of energy and less of an effort. But if this, it is too high and the, the you have to wheel a lot, that will take a lot of more of your energy. So the idea to use ramps um, is, as an alternative to to not having any ramp at all. And, you know, it's not like you, if I'm a wheelchair user, I want to, um, I want a ramp. No, I don't want a ramp because it is an effort to wheel oneself, make and be exhausted from wheeling oneself. So um, if possible, being the same level is better than having a ramp. There are more examples from uh, building construction authority they have, they have um uh revise um every six years or so um the standards that is one of the ideas that they had which is the step usually the step is about two inches or 50 millimeters that's what commonly done by developers and contractors insisting that in um, housing units in ha uh, for housing development, there should be a step into the interior for some reason, um, for some cultural reasons. So it was suggested was that the, this step that you made outside can be removed to install a ramp later. So they showed it in the HDB showroom uh, flats of how, where to put the um, ramp in between the grill and the um, door at the entrance where the height is actually lowered, not 50 millimeters, but possibly 25 millimeters. So you have a one, one is to eight little ramp, easy to negotiate, in which the um, soundtrack development um, company that I showed earlier saw this and, and decided to lower the change of level to 25 millimeters because they were citing the cultural issues that people won't buy the units if um, 
there's no difference of levels from outside to inside for some reason. So there are many examples of how the corridor, um, the guidance by BCA, that the corridor should be minimum 1.5 meters for a person to coming from the opposite side walking and someone in a wheelchair easily could use the corridor. So when you talk about the interior or the units, there could be corridors as well, and which should be 1.2 millimeters so that there can there could be a turning, um, easily turn. Like I mentioned, the 900 by the 1.2. So internal corridors should be 1.2 minimum. Uh, you could push it to 1.15. Um, this it is very is ideal to do so. When we talk about the design of accessible toilets. We talk about transfer, how many transfers can you make to the toilet bowl? And what is space needed? Um, the idea of transfer, that there are about 12 transfers actually being, uh, the study that there are 12 transfers, but actually the in this case, we, we just illustrate four transfers, side, diagonal, and from the front. So um, that influence as illustrated here at the MRT station in Kuala Lumpur, the placement of the toilet bowl and there's an adjustable grab bar on the other side is wrongly done. The grab bar at the back helps um, and this is a site transfer, which I was trying to illustrate here on the left. You can have the front transfer and the diagonal one, and the space is big enough, but the toilet bowl really, if you need to do a central uh, place toilet bowl, you gotta do adjustable bar at both sides and there's enough space to transfer at both sides. So actually the, um, the architect who designed this did not really understand fully um, how to design um, with this space. I mean, in the first place, when you look at this space, you can see the toilet bowl is 450 centered to the wall. And then you have the adjustable grab bar on the other side with the other horizontal bar on this side at the wall. So I have that enough space there, the width of which is 1.9. So you have enough space left over to do a side transfer and enough space from the edge of the toilet to the sink. We would have to revise the 800 door opening to 900. And having said that, when you look at the MRT station toilet, the placement of adjustable bar, the best would be a more uh, fixed bar and push the toilet to the 450 millimeter center to the edge of the wall. You can have a smaller sink and a sink further down so that you can have a front transfer. So you get what I mean when I'm talking about um, how making efficient use of the space. The overall length of this is about 2.3 meters if you put the sink at the other end. Right. There's a possibility of putting the sink at the other side, away from the wall, the nearest, the wall nearest to the toilet, um, the toilet bowl. So there are other examples of design that we can see, and furniture or other equipment could be a hindrance to using toilet properly. Um. And if the toilet is too low, you can put something on top of it so that you can use the toilet.
So in the second part, we were talking about anthropometrics and economics and um, examples of, in, of detailed design for ramp and toilets. And we continue with the universal design principles, the seven universal design principles. I've been using this slide a lot and uh, please forgive me if I didn't put where, where is the original slide come from. Um, so again, we, we, we talk about the, uh, the definition on use of design principles. There are seven principles. Uh, for technology um, using digital software and so on, there have been a lot of it in uh, advancement uh, and using universal design principles, especially simple and intuitive. And if you were to Google universal design, you'll find that many of the development is in digital uh, technology, not architecture. It's kind of slow when it comes to architecture there are some a bit of uh, quite a number of articles, um, uh, but not many in the mainstream regarding universal design thoughts and processes. So, yeah, universal design something that was introduced in nineteen ninety four has been utilized by smartphone developers and digital technology. Architecture is yet to uh, be much more proactive. So universal design asks, is the design and composition of an environment so that it can be accessed, understood, and used to the greatest extent possible by all people, regardless of their age, size, ability, or disability, and environment or any building product service in the environment and should be designed to meet the needs of all people who wish to use it. So we're not excluding non-disabled people, non-disabled people, as I said, in their lives, they will be disabled um, when they have temporary setbacks and the like, or when they are aging. Uh, or being older persons later at the age of 65 and above, uh, for sure, and and even earlier. So these principles are useful for us to understand what they are and being exposed to them. These are not exhaustive or the greatest examples, but I try to explain them as much as I can. The seven principles are equitable use, flexibility in use, Simple and intuitive, perceptible information, tolerance for error, low physical effort, size and space for approach and use. Uh, tolerance for error is dealing with hazards, uh, safety hazards, which is also something that <clears throat> has been incorporated in the barrier-free principles of accessibility, usability, and safety. So um, the others are, are more on the usability part or more on the um, um, accessibility part. The rights of persons with disabilities in many countries has been addressed. And in Malaysia, we have the Uniform Building by Law, 34A or similar under the Streets Drainage and Building Act, where a disabled person can access a building, use the building, and exit the building. So one of the issues of exiting the building to me is means of escape when there is an emergency. How would a disabled person be uh, able to exit a building in times like that? And um, this is, one of the issues um, of safety as well. Let me start with the principle number one, equitable use. I'm not gonna read the first part, um, but 
from the guidelines, the guidelines are very useful for us to remember what does that mean, equitable use. To provide the same means of use for all users, identical whenever possible, equivalent when not. Avoiding segregation or stigmatizing any users. So on the right is um, someone using a kitchenette, which they can wash the, um, that's a tap there on the left, wash the vegetables or prepare the meal, the table, uh, accessible tabletop. This person in a wheelchair could reach for all the utensils, <clears throat> Um, you know, uh, a spice rack, um, pots and pans, because all the heights and everything is uh, for the, in, where the shelves are, are easily reachable. The whole process from preparation to um, cooking and serving could be done here. So is equitable. This kitchenette can be used by anyone. Somebody sitting on a chair or somebody short of stature. Somebody short of stature uh, could be comfortable using it, yes, as well. Maybe not the top shelves. No, nothing is 100%, but this is closer than anything that you would think of when you think about equitable use. Another example of equitable use is just, you are able to access like everybody else. There's no stigmatization. For example, boarding a bus and dealing with the bus conductor or the system in place. Uh, sometimes we have this problem of entering from the middle. And if you're in a country where you don't speak the language, people may think that you're trying to get in for free because you don't know the system and it's not very good. So um, stigma, stigmatized you would be in that situation. Um, so, but a lot of buses been in few countries that have um, entrances in the middle and they use a smart card or something to get around. So these are some of the principles, the first principle and now as a second principle, flexibility in use. The design accommodates a wide range of individual preferences and abilities. So provide a choice and method of use. Accommodate right or left-handed access and use. Facilitate the user's ac accuracy in position. Provide adaptability to the user's pace. The concept of uh, flexibility could be used in architecture. And it is something that is found in universal design. And it's illustrated by equipment as well, like table for a classroom, where the flip down a tabletop is be considered for the left-handed user on the left. And scissors are designed to accommodate for the left-handed people as well, in terms of the design. So products could be made to be much more flexible for the different user needs. Other people, um, such as a wheelchair user, um, on the left, Judy Weish from the Muscular Dystrophy Association, she illustrated the need for a pull-out tabletop, a firm one, uh, from the sh uh, from the cabinet, which was requested by the designer to be included so that they can show off the um, souvenirs that they have or even write on that tabletop. So these are considerations to be met for the, the need of, customized for the need of the user at that time. And there's always a good a thing to ask what they need so that you can design the best possible way a wheelchair that is being uh, designed and built to accommodate for children growth. When they get to a certain age, they need to adjust the seat 
and the height and so on. So this wheelchair is does that. So that's flexibility in use. So the third one is simple and intuitive use, which is actually the use of the design that is easy to understand and regardless of the user's experience, knowledge, language skills, or current concentration level. As a guideline, it eliminates unnecessary complexity. It also be consistent with user expectations and intuition, accommodate a wide range of literacy and language skills, arrange information consistent with its importance, provide effective prompting and feedback during and after task completion. The best product that illustrates simple and intuitive use are smartphones, actually. UX, UI, UX. There's another quote uh, from Jared Spool. A design is intuitive when people just know what to do and they don't have to go through any training to get there. So your smartphone, you know the basics, uh, you get the grips of the buttons. So um, swiping up and down. When a design is not intuitive, our attention moves away from what we're trying to accomplish to how we can get the interface to accomplish what we want. The smartphone is so easy to use that you end up being addictive to it. So, you know, <laughs> you can't really think that you don't want to use your smartphone. Um, so anyway, another equipment is the tap that is mixed, uh, mixing tap with up and down lever, which is easy to, even if you don't have fingers, you can negotiate this tap and it's not that complicated to use, obviously. Also an example of a plug and the socket where there is a hole and you can just pull out with your forefinger in it. Perceptible information is principle number four. The design communicates necessary information effectively to the user regardless of ambient conditions or the user's sensory abilities. This one is more to do with um those who who um perceive differently than others maybe there is no sight to read so then you have to use tactile um a touch or audio listening if you can't hear then you use visual vision and you use other means obviously so as a guide, using different modes, pictorial, verbal, or tactile for redundant presentation of essential information, provide adequate contrasts between essential information and its surroundings, maximize legibility of essential information, differentiate elements in, a ways, in ways that can be described i.e. make it easy to give instructions or directions, provide compatibility with a variety of techniques or devices used by people with sensory limitations. But the obvious one is this international color code, uh, white on the, on the picture, on the figures, and um, with the blue background, this color blue, this is an international color um, in many standards. This is uh, the contrast for designing uh, perceptible information um, notices for people. They added in braille for this, uh, it's a picture of this uh, for, to indicate uh, for toilet, uh, toilet or restroom facilities for men, women. And there is a um, access logo. It's not a wheelchair person or, or <laughs> that is the one, you know, on, on the left is international symbol of access. That's a correct word for it. There's even braille down there. And the one on the right is um, just the parking where you go and you add, um, a person in a wheelchair logo, which is different than the other one. So people would 
trying to give information to others so that the service provided could ease their way around uh, they had and find their way around and navigate and and get to where they want needed to go. So this perceptible information also include a warning tactile at the edge of the curb when before you want to cross the road. Yeah, warning tactiles, the one with the dot emboss uh, protruding out based on requirement is six millimeters or five millimeters dome and you can feel it under your feet or your foot um and it's uh raised enough so that you can discern the know that that is a warning tactile so it indicates that there is a warning for the non-sighted person is either there you are going to cross a road or there's a different direction that you need to go or there's a change of levels. That's the reason for the warning dot type tactile guide. For perceptible information, we also have it contrasted with other information uh, and clearly being put up to instruct on the right for uh, someone using the wheelchair to wait for the bus captain to assist them at this bus stop. We have also information on um, plastic or something that is more robust and durable information that the driver is a deaf person and that you can communicate using these cards behind the driver's seat. So yeah, that is possible. So the fifth principle is tolerance for error. The design maximize, minimizes hazards and the adverse consequences of accidental or unintended actions. As a guide, arrange elements to minimize hazards and errors. Most used elements, most accessible hazardous element and elements eliminated, isolated, or shielded. Provide warnings of hazards and errors. Provide fail-safe features. Discourage unconscious action in tasks that require vigilance. Giving a sense to the designer, uh, sorry, giving a sense to the user that um, you are comfortable using a design. For example, a blind person walking on the street, if there is like a obstruction, like the underside of the staircase, that is a hazard for that person because they can't see that that hazard. And there could be a, a warning on the floor, a tactile, um, tactile guide warning tiles. So that they, they will know, oh, I have to be careful what's out what's in front of me. So they can reach out and, and feel this obstruction. Or they could we could isolate this obstruction or this hazard by uh, creating a barrier uh, that that uh, don't allow you to go into the, that space and get hit by hit your head and uh, against it. So the other safety issue issues on the right Kara with a toddler in the bathtub she has a, the bathtub is designed with a ledge so that she could actually help to be, uh, be in a position where she's comfortable to assist the toddler in the bathtub and there are grab rails as well so on the left there is the design of the curb ramp that where the flares are very gradual and seamlessly going into the road. Principle number six is the low um, physical effort where the design can be used efficiently and comfortably with a minimum of fatigue. As a guide, it allows users to maintain a neutral body position 
use reasonable operating forces, minimize repetitive actions, and minimize sustained physical effort. So the good il illustration are using lever types because in case somebody don't have fingers, they can push it down. Yeah, lever type door door handles. Sorry. So there's also the push button operation to open the doors. And these are things that apparatus uh, such as doors or sliding doors, which has um, make it easier for someone to, to utilize the cabinet on the left. And on the right is a bench with a grab rail that you can push upwards. If you have a lower, weaker limb, limbs, and it every little thing, every little thing could assist you in in um, your everyday effort, and this helps a lot. So going to the last principle, size and space for approach use, approach, um, and use. Appropriate size and space is provided for approach, reach, manipulation, and use regardless of the user's body size, posture, or mobility. The guide here is that provide a clear line of sight to important elements for any seated or standing user. Make reach to all components comfortable for any seated or standing user. Accommodate vari variations in hand and grip size. Provide adequate space for the use of assistive devices or personal assistance. So an example on the left is the shower stall where somebody in the wheelchair could transfer himself to the flip down seating and reach and manipulate the handles and so on to get a shower. On the right here, we have someone accessing a hatched floor surface where there's a car park uh, space that gives room for someone to enter with a wheelchair um, at 1.2 mil uh, meters wide. Usually uh, you need extra space so that you could uh, use um, to enter the, the car. I have some examples of um, students of architecture who did access audit on existing buildings such as a sports complex and um, one did um, a unisex accessible changing room because unisex um, to toilets, uh, especially accessible toilet or changing room in this case, would allow uh, the other, the spouse which are of different gender to the person he, he or she is helping or anyone, in fact, to assist them. And in here, um, Tan Ju Yi uh, placed everything in this um, 4.2 meters by 2.7 meters space, um, shower area, changing area, WC, and considered the white door because the wheelchairs that one used for um, sports could be very wide, about one meter width. You know, as you recall, it was 900 before, right? So she did a 1.2 meter door clearance, sliding door. So what we're trying to say here is depending on the type of building like sports complex depending on the use and the diverse needs the design is giving choices for people to uh, use it and also the another one is the municipal pool swimming pool and chang chang wai yung did um considered all manner of accessibility into the pool. If you were using a wheelchair, if you were uh, 
uh, using a crutch or anything with adequate railings and, and um, accessible step entry, um, you know, it was the only way that one could go into was the ladder entry without even the railings. Uh, there was railings, so. But that was only allowed a few people to use the pool. So now everyone can use the pool. So that this couple of exercises really help to show how the designer could design a wonderful, inclusive university design uh, product or architecture or part of a building and something that we could learn until whenever when I have the chance to do so later in life. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening. Do uh, drop any comments below or contact me or follow me on any of the social media platforms shown in this slide at Instagram, you will have at Designs As Way, LinkedIn, Facebook, Naziati Muhammad Yaqub, and you can listen to Talk Architecture podcasts as well. Thank you.